Today, I am thrilled to introduce the person who is going to be introducing our speaker, uh, and that is Changming Cheng. Changming, I have been in contact with on email because he saw today's speaker and just said he had, he had to be part of the Newton series. And so this is kind of a, a, a nice thing about giving back. I think at the beginning of the semester, uh, Professor Sidhu had talked about uh, paying it forward. And Changming was in the inaugural class of Masters of Engineering graduates, which was three, the, three classes ago, and he has been paying it forward ever since. Not only did he um, investigate our speaker and uh, passionately urge that uh, he come up and talk with you all, but he has been here for I think less than 24 hours. In Berkeley, he came up from Los Angeles and has already held, uh, he's just held one Masters of Engineering session, kind of a lecture talking with everybody there. And he's doing another one tonight with the CET Student Association. So I can't thank him enough for all the work that he's doing. And right now he's a program manager at Microsoft. And I have to get in there that he has a patent to his name, which I always think is pretty impressive. So Chang Ming, thank you very much. Hello, people. It's good to be back. So I'll say something about myself. Just two years ago, I was right there seated where you are right now. And I do come for these lectures. And what I was to say is some of the speakers that I listened to made an impact. Some made an impression, but most don't. But yes, that's true, though. Uh, so you can get my honest feedback here at Clark today. But what I found out with um, the speaker for today, his name is Nova Spivak. I met him over at LA uh, on a business conference. And I felt that he would be someone that would uh, give you very good insights, uh, whether you want to go into high tech as an engineer or as an entrepreneur. He's very strategic in thinking. He's been around for a long time, since the origins of the internet. He was the first, uh, one of the first few people that actually f uh, found some in web-based startups and actually went IPO. And in fact, he has two IPOs. And the other interesting fact that you want to know about him, he's actually a part-time astronaut. He has been with the Russian Air Force, flew to the edge of space. He has went with the Russian Space Agency, doing something crazy up there. I'll, tell you, I'll, let, him, I'll let him share more uh, later on. So let's put our hands together to welcome Nova Spivak. Thanks. Hello, can you guys hear me? So I'm from LA, um, not originally from Boston, actually, originally, and uh, lived out here for a bunch of years, lived in New York for a bunch of years. Um, my career in pictures does not mean movies. It means photos. I'm going to tell you um, th about the long and winding and, un and sort of unexpected journey that I've been on to this point. I'm actually 80 years old. Um, I just look young. No, I, I haven't been around since the very beginning of the internet. I've been around, I was born, I guess, around the time that the internet started. But uh, I've, I've been certainly around since the beginning of the web. Um, one little note, I'm wearing sunglasses. Well, they're glasses, and they tint in bright light. So it's not that I'm trying to be cool, but if they start tinting, that's just can't help it. All right, so let's get into it. I grew up, as I mentioned, in the Boston area. Um, this is Kendall Square, uh, where MIT is located. And I happened to grow up really close to Kendall Square. Um, that little guy in the front is me. Um, I was always trying to be a leader when I was young. Um, I was also interested in being a ninja. Um, I don't know if you can see the ninja in the photo. My parents were artists, but that's my mother. She, um, uh, my father, this is an older picture of him. Um, so my mother is a poet. My father is a sculptor. But he was also an inventor for hire um, and used to go to big companies like Polaroid and, and invent for them. So Polaroid, for example, hired him to make 100 inventions for their camera uh, process. Uh, the, the company that made Silly Putty do you know what Silly Putty is? Uh, hired him to make inventions for new uses of Silly Putty. So we used to have huge canisters of Silly Putty in our house, dripping into everything and getting into our floor. Um, so it was a kind of creative environment. I wasn't allowed to watch TV as a child. Instead, we had three different rooms for making things. We had a, a room for building stuff, an art room, and uh, I think it was another room for writing and, and stuff like that. So we had these kind of creative spaces. We weren't allowed to watch TV, and I think, until I was eight or so, which was good and bad. I wouldn't do that. Don't do that to your kids. Um, because I, I, I ended up getting into school and having complete ignorance of anything, any culture in this country. So I kind of showed up from another planet. Uh, my father actually used to drive a field ambulance just because he got one. He has his car. 
And, um, and so we would show up at an elementary school in a field ambulance. Um, and also, he, he, he really liked surplus, army surplus. And so he ended up, in Boston, we have some pretty you know, severe winters. I know you don't have that out here, but you know what a winter is. He got a US Coast Guard rescue outfit, uh, which was a big orange jumpsuit uh, with big silver moon boots. And so he'd, he'd drive up to elementary school in a field ambulance. It was a World War I field ambulance, by the way. He would get out in his basically a hazmat suit, and then he would let my brother and I out. Um, and we also were completely ignorant of anything, you know, any American culture. So we were real aliens, true aliens um, in elementary school. That's how I began. Uh, and I have this name, Nova, uh, which is a strange name. It did not serve me well as a kid. Um, people teased me. Avon, they used to go, Avon, you never looked good. Because there was this tagline for the Avon company, which was, Avon, you never looked so good. So anyway, I, I got teased a lot. I was an outsider as a kid. Um, my first computer was a deck rainbow. Um, these are the old days of computing. Um, this was a, what was it, a DOS computer, MS-DOS, uh, before Windows. And uh, I also had a Timex Sinclair. You guys don't know what that is, but uh, it was basically several decades ago, precursor to uh, a tablet, effectively. <laughs> Um, and I, of course, spent a lot of time around MIT. My father was on the faculty. He, he had got a city planning degree, as well as all the other stuff he did. So I spent a lot of time there. They used to experiment on me and my brother at MIT in the computer science lab. They, they had this game called Wumpus, which was a very early uh, game. Um, I guess it was like a Unix-based game. And they, would, they were testing kids and, and their reactions to computers by playing this Wumpus game. So they did experiments and testing us weird computer science experiments as a kid. And I kind of got interested in computers. My grandfather happened to be Peter Drucker, um, who is the founding father of management science. Um, so we, we had that also in our family. I grew up in this kind of background where I was exposed to management thinking as a young child. We would take walks in the summer in the mountains in Colorado, and he would lecture to me on the future of China um, and how you know, the, the, the disparity between the rich and the poor and the coastal cities and the farmers and you know, all this stuff as a kid. Um, I, took an interest, I took an interest in network security um, and started exploring uh, novel applications of, of network, network security as a child. Um, and you can, you can interpret that how you want. But uh, I got into some trouble doing that, um, exploring the weaknesses of certain companies around the Boston area. And um, eventually got interested in something called HyperCard, which came from Apple. I don't know if any of you have heard of HyperCard, but if anybody wants to start an amazing company, Go look at HyperCard and build a modern version of HyperCard. It was one of the coolest programming tools ever designed by anybody. It came out of Apple. It's one of the early Mac applications. HyperCard let you basically build little webs, but they were programmable in a way that I still have not seen anybody replicate. So I started programming in HyperCard and consulting around Boston to companies building HyperCard apps for them. One thing led to another. People heard that I could do this, and I ended up working for this guy. This is Ray Kurzweil. Um, I'm sure many of you know who he is. He's the guy who's popular, uh, popularizing the idea of the singularity. So I ended up working for Ray Kurzweil um, at one of his companies on the reading machine. He built a machine that could read to the blind. The reading machine, uh, you could show it a text, and it would basically do, it was early days of character recognition. It would read the text out loud to the blind. So I started programming hypercard applications that connected to the output of things like the reading machine um, to build databases from whatever was being scanned. So I, that was one of my early jobs. I was actually still, I think I was still in high school when I did that. And during that time, I, I got interested in journalism, technology journalism. And The Economist magazine had an internship program uh, for, for tech journalism. Uh, I applied for that program. They rejected me. but um, they, they introduced me to this guy. This is Danny Hillis. Danny Hillis um, created Thinking Machines, which was one of the biggest, coolest AI companies uh, of this era. This was, uh, when I met him, it was around sometime in the late 80s. Um, he's a great computer scientist out of MIT. Um, the Connection Machine was what Thinking Machines made. Um, and it was a supercomputer, a parallel supercomputer. It also happened to look really cool had all kinds of flashing lights all over it, had 65,000 processors in it, uh, which at the time was a big deal. 
uh, cost about $100 million, and was both, mostly used by uh, big labs, big physics labs, governments, um, credit card companies, and so forth, to do big data and uh, data science in the early days. Um, this guy sat next to me. This is Brewster Kale, who uh, runs the Internet Archive, um, the Wayback Machine. At the time, he was working on something called Waze, which was wide area information systems. It was one of the first search engines. Um, and it could collect data around the internet and search it before the web, long before the web. Another person I met during this time, while I was still in college, uh, in high school and then in college, um, and I'll tell you about college in a minute, was this guy. This is Stephen Wolfram. Uh, Stephen Wolfram, as you know, runs Mathematica, um, Wolfram Research, um, and uh, many other things, as you know. I ended up going to Oberlin College. Uh, Oberlin, I didn't want to go there, but um, <laughs> my mother had gone there and uh, forced me to apply. So as a joke, I, I, made an I made an essay. You know, you have your Y College X essay, so in this case, Y Oberlin. My essay was how much I didn't want to go to Oberlin and how paranoid I was that I'd get accepted. Anyway, they thought it was really creative and offered me basically a full scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go. Um, so while I was at Oberlin, I was working full-time for Thinking Machines as a programmer, um, coding for them and, and also doing technical writing for them, um, and conversing with people like Stephen Wolfram and Brewster Kale. It's kind of in this Kendall Square um, salon, if you will, that I was connected to. Oberlin is a, a great liberal arts college in the middle of nowhere. There's absolutely nothing to do off campus, so it has a very intense uh, campus life. So that actually turned out to be great. And while I was there, uh, I went through a series of different majors. Uh, I, th I think I began thinking I was still going to be a tech journalist. Uh, that quickly turned into art, art uh, turned into painting, but I couldn't handle the fumes, so I did art history. And then I decided, no, I still like computers. So I went to the computer science department um, and ended up majoring in philosophy of mind, which was cognitive science. So that was my winding trip through Oberlin. Um, while I was there, they have a winter term program, and one of the things that you do is you try to come up with interesting projects. So I ended up working on this, Star Trek The Next Generation at Paramount Studios. So I actually wanted to do, I wanted to do dolphin research, but, um, and I actually got accepted, but it was too late, and so I ended up doing this Paramount thing, uh, which turned out to be really interesting. Uh, one of the big takeaways from that is don't work in the film industry, um, but it was really interesting. TV, actually, in this case. Met the cast, worked on that show for a while. Went back to Oberlin, continuing. And I was driving home, I think it was my junior year, I was driving home from Oberlin after the year had ended, and somebody told me about an article in the Atlantic Monthly um, about this book called Three Scientists and Their Gods. And I read the article and it was amazing, so then I re went and got the book and read the book. Uh, and what this book was about uh, was this idea of digital physics. The idea that the universe might be equivalent to, or it might literally be, a giant computer. And all of a sudden, all these different things I had been working on came together. So thinking machines had been simulating uh, all kinds of physical systems using parallel computing. Kurzweil was basically doing artificial intelligence and simulating, if you will, early aspects of the brain. Three scientists and their gods featured different scientists, but one of, the, one of the key people in here in this book was Ed Fredkin, who started, uh, was one of the people who started MIT's computer science program. And Ed Fredkin was one of the early uh, theorists in the field of cellular automata, which is, as I mentioned, is all about digital physics and is about how, how we might be able to explain many things in the, in the physical world using very simple uh, models, which we'll talk about in a minute. So I got really interested in this idea um, and started exploring it. Everything kind of came together, and that became the focus of my computer science studies um, and my philosophy of mind and cognitive science uh, studies at Oberlin. So I, I decided I wanted to meet this guy. I tried to hunt him down, but he was incredibly elusive. Instead, I found the two professors who were running his project at MIT. Tommaso Toffoli and Norman Margolis. These look like mugshots. Actually, they're, I think they're just their pages at MIT. I think you can tell how good a professor is by how bad their mugshots are. <laughs> These guys are total geniuses. So they were working on digital physics. They had built a new uh, parallel computer and a book about it um, for physics, um, talking about how to use cellular automata to simulate physics. 
Uh, a simple example of a cellular automaton is the Game of Life, uh, John Conway's Game of Life. You may have, have heard of this, um, you may have seen it. You basically have a grid and you have, little, you have rules, uh, simple rules that run um, at every step in time in the same way at every point in the grid. And basically what the rules do is they count the number of neighbors around you that are either on or off. Um, and then based on that, you, the center changes state. So I change state if a certain number of cells around me are on, I turn on or I turn off. And, and that's it. The rule's that simple. I either stay the same, turn on, or turn off. Turns out that these simple rules can generate incredibly lifelike behavior. And so if you were looking at this thing and it was running, you'd see these things kind of moving around. They act like little living critters. It's like looking at bacteria. Now, there, there are a huge class of different kinds of rules in different numbers of dimensions. Um, and there's all kinds of variations on these. And what these guys figured out is that you can actually simulate quantum mechanics this way. You can simulate voting dynamics. You can simulate um, how sand um, moves in, on a beach or in sand dunes. You can figure out catastrophes in the stock market. All kinds of different systems can be modeled with this very simple idea. And so this is kind of the foundation both of the digital physics movement, which has developed a lot since then, uh, and also of a field called artificial life, uh, which is coming back. Uh, in artificial life, the idea was use simple rules to power systems that can evolve and, and learn and become lifelike and interact. So sometimes you you create systems like artificial sheep and artificial wolves that would compete in an artificial ecosystem. In other cases, um, in artificial life, you'd make little crabs. That's a little robot crab. And these populations of little crabs would compete with each other. So I got very interested in all of this. So this is, this is all background, really, before my career officially began. Um, I then graduated from college and took off for a year uh, to Asia, just wandering around and backpacking. Ended up in India studying Buddhism. And uh, I met this guy and spent some time with him, the Dalai Lama and uh, studied a completely different uh, angle of the mind. Uh, I've always been very interested in the mind and consciousness um, from, from all different perspectives, and this was, this was one perspective. When I came back, I got a job uh, at a company called Individual Inc. filtering news. And what they had done is they had got a huge set of intelligent agents, and they were filtering news wires uh, and doing linguistics on news wires to try to find important stories for big companies. So I was working at Individual as part of an algorithm where machines would filter news wires and then humans would come and look at the output and decide if it was good. And if it was good, they would approve it and that would get sent off to the heads of BizDev at, at different big companies like IBM and AT&T. I was looking at about 1,500 articles a night as part of my job and I'd have to read them. It was a night shift. I'd have to read these articles, decide if they were good, if I'd seen them before and either approve them or not. And then that would feed back into the algorithm. And I started to see a ton of articles coming across about the web. At the time, there were a bunch of online services, AOL, CompuServe, and Prodigy were the big ones. And there was this transition happening. There were CD-ROMs were coming out. And people were asking, you know, are CD-ROMs going to be the next medium? Is it going to be online services? But then there was all this discussion about HTML and this new thing, HTTP. I saw this happen and decided, wow, you know, I don't want to just filter news about this. I want to do this. So I got back into programming and started a little group of, of programmers in Boston. And we started doing little coding projects around town. One thing led to another. I met some, some guys. Uh, and we decided to start a project called ReliefNet. So ReliefNet began actually as a Gopher site. Gopher was a protocol that was before the web. It was a text-based directory um, browser, effectively. There were brow it was a directory. Uh, system that you could browse effectively. So you could create Gopher sites that were like websites without any graphics. Um, so we decided we would create um, a Gopher site about uh, what was going on in the nonprofit world. We wanted to help the world and do something good. Uh, at the time, there was a hunger crisis in Rwanda. Um, at, there was a, a lot of information that was flowing around about this, this famine, but there was no efficient way for people to donate to help. So we created ReliefNet, first as a Gopher site and later as an early website. This is, this is ReliefNet in Netscape, in an early version of Netscape, uh, when graphics had just become available in Netscape. You could actually render a picture, finally. Um, and what we did is we got charities, and we put them on the web for the first time. So things like the Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, Oxfam, 
um, and other major international charities. We put them on the web. We did it for them. And we focused on information about what they were doing in Rwanda. And then we created a system where people could call in or fax in information that they wanted to make a donation, and somebody would call them back and get their credit card. The next thing we did was we reached out to Warner Brothers Music. And in order to get more traffic to ReliefNet, we, we negotiated something where they would give us early sound clips from upcoming albums to put in ReliefNet. And so we did Relief Rock, which was the first online benefit concert. So the idea was you could hear music from albums that hadn't come out yet in ReliefNet, and hopefully you'd make a donation. That ended up getting us into Newsweek. So from, from the Newsweek article, we started getting a lot of phone calls. We thought we were going to build a business around this, and that we were going to uh, take a percentage of the money we raised for charity, and that was how we were going to make money. That's our, that was our theory. Turned out that the charities didn't want us to take a percentage, so that was not a good idea. Um, and secondly, we started getting all these phone calls from ad agencies saying, what is this internet thing? Can you tell us about this internet thing? And they were all, they were all in New York. We got a lot of calls like that. So we started going to New York and teaching these ad agencies what the internet was and what the web was for the first time. So now we're talking about 1994, approximately. Um, at that point, the world was still trying to figure out if the web was a commercial opportunity or not. And ad agencies were trying to help their, their clients understand whether or not they should use the web. That was the question at the time. Should I use the web for anything? So we were educating them. Uh, and we realized, wow, there's a big opportunity here to build uh, a giant website of some sort. So what we decided to do, um, and what we knew best, uh, was to teach people how to build websites on the web. We created a site called EarthWeb. And what EarthWeb did was it pulled together information about how to uh, code or develop for the web in every different language, how to integrate all kinds of different databases and tools together in, to make commerce-driven websites and to do transactions and so forth. That was what we began with. We, we became very popular. We were in the top 50 sites on, on the web at the time. And it grew rapidly because everybody else wanted to learn how to make websites. I had people coming to me quitting their jobs or wanting to quit their jobs to join our company. But they were crazy things. Like I had a guy who made chocolate in Florida, and he wanted to become a web entrepreneur. I had somebody who made knishes in New York. We had people who wanted to leave their high paying jobs at fashion, big fashion brands. They were completely unqualified. Everybody wanted to get into the web business. Everybody who was graduating from college at the time was thinking, I've got to do something in the web. So it was very exciting at that moment in, the, in New York when we were doing this, we started pitching big companies to build websites for them. And, and that was a big part of our business as well in the beginning. We built the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art's first website. Uh, we built the New York Stock Exchange's first website. Uh, we did BMG Music Club, which was a big CD music club. They used to mail you CDs. Uh, and a lot of these big, big projects, sometimes more than a million bucks for a website which at the time was unheard of. Nobody else was charging that much. Uh, clients used to come in and we'd say, we're too expensive. That was the first thing we would say. We're too expensive for you, so let's not waste anybody's time. And of course, that always worked really well. Um, anyway, as well as building sites and teaching people how to do this, we made sites about how to build websites. The first one was called Gamelon, and it was about Java. If you remember, I had mentioned I worked at a company called Thinking Machines that did supercomputing. Well, that company eventually blew up. The whole, thinking, the whole supercomputing uh, industry kind of blew up because new generations of hardware came out that made it much cheaper to do the same amount of computation. And so these big monolithic companies charging $100 million um, were just disrupted. The team at Thinking Machines that I knew was acquired by Sun Microsystems. And that became the team that created Java, which was originally called Oak. So I knew about Java well before it had become a public topic. And so we were prepared. We saw Java coming and thought, wow, the cool thing about Java at the time was this idea of an applet, which allows you to run code in the browser instead of on the server. And so we could make more multimedia rich experiences by pushing the computation down to the edge onto the user's computer instead of having to do everything on the server, which was a big problem. So we got very excited about Java, and we made a site called Gamelon. Now, Gamelon is the music, the indigenous music on the island of Java. And the reason we chose the name Gamelon is because there were no coffee names available at the time. 
So Gamelon became one of the first open source communities. And what it did was it, it was a directory of everything that anybody was doing with Java anywhere in the world. So as soon as Java was announced, about two weeks later, we launched Gamelon. And it became one of the most popular sites on the web at the time. Um, so developers everywhere were obsessed with Java. And we're using Gamelon to share their code, to share their apps, and to look up each other's work and share how-tos and resources. It became a big exchange for code and apps. We wrote books. We raised money. Uh, and eventually, we started acquiring other companies. So we acquired an, um, Datamation, which was an IT publication about databases. We, we uh, built a site called developer.com, which was a superset of Gamelon and covered every technology. And then we bought a little company called Dice, at, uh, which was in Des Moines at the time. Um, and now that's actually become a big company. So EarthWeb um, grew rapidly. In about four years, we grew from zero to almost 300 people. Uh, and we went public uh, in 98. Uh, and I think at the, the day we went public, we were the sixth largest gaining IPO in NASDAQ history. Um, it went up something like 240 something percent in the first day, which was a big deal at the time. Um, Subsequently, I stayed involved for another year or so. And then I kind of decided, you know, I'm done with this. First of all, it had been five years. Uh, the company had changed. It had gotten really big. It was no longer about innovation. It was about sales. It was about the bottom line. It just wasn't as interesting to me as it had been. And a whole new uh, generation of people had come in um, to run it, a whole bunch of professional managers. It, the culture had changed from a small innovation team to a, a growing company. Uh, a large company, technically. And so I decided it was time for me to leave day-to-day -day operations and just stay on the board, which I did. And I took some time off. Um, one of the things I did, as was mentioned, is I went to Russia um, and pursued uh, another interest of mine, which was space. And so I, I bribed the Russian Space Agency and Russian Air Force to let me play with their toys. Uh, and so in 1999, I flew to the edge of space uh, and also did zero gravity training in one of the early zero gravity um, vehicles, uh, the Ilyushin 76. Uh, so I did that, which was pretty interesting. Um, I, I had previously, I didn't mention this, but I, I had previously gotten the equivalent of a master's degree um, in the space industry um, th through something called the International Space University. So that connected me with these people and enabled me to do that, which was a great adventure. And then the bubble burst. Uh, so basically, all the wealth that me and all of my friends had amassed evaporated in about four or five days. Um, you know, it was, it was unbelievable. Nobody expected it. None of us uh, thought that, that would ever happen. We thought, this is going to go on forever. This party's never going to stop. Um, and it was a real shock, of course, to everyone. So uh, I ended up doing some consulting work after that um, to figure out what I was going to do next. EarthWeb continued, but um, eventually, uh, the content assets were sold, and Dice.com, which is a leading job board for tech jobs, became what remained and still remains today and actually went public again um, in, uh, I think it was 2007, if I'm not mistaken, or 2008. So I ended up consulting and working with SRI, which is Stanford Research International um, in Menlo Park. Um, and we initially were trying to figure out what should SRI do with the internet? because SRI hadn't been particularly active with the internet, but they had been very uh, influential in the computer, uh, personal computing revolution. The mouse was invented by SRI, and a lot of other amazing technologies. So I went in and looked at their patent portfolio and found they had thousands of patents and tons of PhDs and amazing IP around MPEG and, and other video standards and also around artificial intelligence. So we came up with an idea, let's start an incubator. So we started an incubator at, at SRI. And out of that, uh, many things happened. One of those projects that I was actually involved in in the early days was Siri, which you all know about on the iPhone. That actually began in a DARPA project that I worked on at SRI, um, to, which was called Kalo, for Cognitive Agent That Learns and Organizes. It was an artificial intelligence project. And at this point, I was viewed as a kind of artificial intelligence expert because I'd worked on all these different projects. Uh, and so we incubated the early technologies, which later became Siri. That got me very interested in the semantic web. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard of the semantic web. Uh, it was a set of standards from the W3C uh, uh, for creating metadata that was machine understandable that you could attach to any website or any page or any piece of data. Uh, I got very interested in that. 
ended up building a platform for the semantic web that sort of was related to the research that I did at SRI. And then we spun it out as a company. The company was called Radar Networks, and the product was called Twine. And it was a, a website that used semantic web technology to build communities of interest that would self-organize. So people could bookmark or find things and drop them into these different communities. We would analyze the content of the pages using natural language processing. And then we would build uh, semantic webs from all of that information. So these communities were grow they were kind of growing knowledge bases of stuff they were interested in. And there were hundreds or actually thousands of these communities eventually. It grew from zero to three million people um, in about six months. Uh, technically, we grew faster than Twitter. We grew faster than the Wikipedia. Um, the growth was not sustained in the long term, but it was an interesting experience. W we learned a lot. One of the lessons from that experience was not to be the first company to commercialize a new W3C standard. Uh, it turned out that there were no developer tools and there were no databases that could scale to a consumer site um, that were using these technologies. And so we had to build our own developer tools and we had to build our own database that could use RDF and OWL and Sparkle and these standards. That turned out to be overly complicated because as well as building our own product, we had to build our developer tools and our database. So our, our venture capital got dispersed across too many different projects uh, and made it very hard uh, to, to sustain our growth on, on a technical level. Um, the other thing that happened uh, was that the second bubble uh, burst, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, when, that, when that happened, we sold the company to Every, uh, which was owned by Paul Allen. And at that point, um, I was doing a lot of blogging about the future. This is um, a graph that I, I came up with at that time. This, we're in the, now in the early, where are we now? Somewhere in the early 2000s. This was a graph about what I thought the future would look like. And it's actually been fairly accurate. Um, looking at the evolution of different technologies, you can find it on my blog. Um, from Web 3.0, which is an unfortunate term that I co-originated. Um, people hated the 3.0, but it spread widely. Um, and at that time, I was looking at semantic search was a big topic. Bing actually um, led that. Um, also, uh, Danny Hillis from Thinking Machines, who I mentioned to you earlier, um, created uh, a big semantic site, which was later sold to Google and became the foundation of the knowledge graph there. So a lot of folks were talking about this. The next thing that I saw from my early work on the, the technology that would later be Siri was intelligent personal agents, or what are now called intelligent virtual assistants. So that's what this graph was talking about, that Web 4.0 would be all about intelligent virtual assistants automating your work or helping you or representing you. And it looks like that actually might happen. Then the bubble burst again. Um, so it, it's all about timing really is all about timing. It's, it, you know, being an entrepreneur in the tech industry or in any kind of Cambrian explosion is all about luck and timing um, and persistence, I would say. Think of it as white water or fluid dynamics. You want to end up at a certain point at the end of a river, but there's a lot of white water rapids between you and the end. And the goal is to insert yourself into the right place where you're most likely to get washed downstream. Um, but it's, it's very hard. It's very chaotic. You can't really predict what's going to happen. Um, and so, you know, bubbles do happen. So after the bubble burst and EarthWeb was sold, um, and it wasn't the greatest exit, it wasn't the greatest outcome. Um, you know, I was a little bit, uh, shall we say, skeptical about the idea of starting just one company and betting everything on just one company. And I realized that the VCs that I was dealing with, you know, were taking a completely different strategy. They were taking a portfolio strategy. You know, as an entrepreneur, I tended to put all my eggs in one basket and spend four or five years just working on that. And you know, if we got out at the right time, great. If we got bought, great. If a bubble happened, bad. Uh, but you know, it was a very risky bet because you're putting everything in one project. So I decided I would try a portfolio strategy of my own. And I came up with this idea of what I called, at the time, a venture studio. So it was a fusion of a Hollywood movie studio model and a venture capital angel investing model. The idea was we would start and incubate a lot of projects. We would, add, we would raise funding from others or, and put our own funding in. Um, and we would, we would basically decide if these projects were meeting their milestones. And if they were, we'd keep funding them. And if they weren't, we would turn them off. It was kind of a natural selection model. But the key was that we were starting the companies and rather, rather than having the companies come to us from outside. So 
Um, I got involved at a number of companies. I was the first investor in Clout. I met the founders and, and basically helped uh, incubate that company. Clout uh, measures influence on the social web. Started a company called Live Matrix, which indexed everything on the web that had a start and an end time. So any live event on the web, whether it was a live streaming video or a sale or a live chat with a celebrity, we would find it, we would index it. It was a search engine for events. Um, and it was like a TV guide model. I started The Daily Dot, which is a wonderful site you should check out, which is a newspaper about what's going on online that's interesting to consumers. It's not, for, it's not like TechCrunch for the industry, where TechCrunch is like variety. The Daily Dot is like People Magazine or Newsweek. Um, Streamglider. Um, so some of these companies worked and some didn't. Clout had a great exit this year. Live Matrix was sold uh, a year or two ago. The Daily Dot is growing. It's actually the fastest growing publication online today. It's growing incredibly quickly. It's, I think, must be getting close to 10 million readers right now. And then I also got involved in a bunch of other startups that I advise. Um, Next IT, which is building next generation intelligent virtual assistants. So very smart avatars um, that can dialogue with you in a very lifelike way. They're, they're using them really for customer service and training. So they're building artificial teachers and artificial customer service reps. The Army uses them. Big insurance companies and pharmaceuticals use them. Uh, airlines use them. Uh, Syncentia is a company that I've been advising. They have an amazing artificial intelligence technology that reads customer records and generates knowledge that can be reasoned on from that. So the application is insurance. They take all the records in an insurance company, they read them automatically, and actually figure out all the logic of that business so that if a customer calls and says, am I covered for this problem? The system can answer it automatically. It turns out in the insurance industry, there's more than a billion dollars a year of money that's just lost because of claim error. Because a human calls a human and says, am I covered for this problem? And the human makes a mistake. Because it's too hard to figure out if you're covered. There's too much data. So this system figures it out automatically and virtually eliminates claim error, saving billions of dollars. It's really cool. Also invested in, Cam in Cambrian Genomics. Cambrian Genomics is making the first DNA laser printer. It prints DNA. It's like a laser printer for printing DNA. Um, I actually have my AngelList profile on DNA from them. They printed it on, as DNA. The idea is DNA can be used for storage. It's incredibly um, information rich. You can store data with DNA. So Cambrian Genomics is revolutionizing um, this industry of creating custom molecules, custom DNA, where it used to cost thousands of dollars to do it. They're bringing the price down to hundreds of dollars. The next thing I did um, out of the incubator was Bottlenose. And as, as luck would have it, Bottlenose really took off. And so I decided to jump in and be CEO. Um, instead of continuing with the Venture Studio idea, I decided to focus again on one company. Because this one really showed signs of, of being a breakout. And the other ones I got CEOs into, and they're, 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 they've either been sold, uh, one or two didn't work, and the others are still growing. Um, but Bottlenose is what I ended up focusing on. So Bottlenose, the basic idea, if you remember that graph I showed you of the future of technology, um, one of the trends that I was tracking was real time and the shift to real time. Um, so we started Bottlenose uh, about five years ago with an insight that, that the internet was going to shift more and more real time. And I'd been thinking about this a lot, even Live Matrix with events. We were thinking about events online as being important. So with Bottlenose, we decided, let's find a way um, to capture all of this real time data that's being created and figure out what the trends are. Where, what, what does it all mean? And we started with Twitter. So we started ingesting and measuring Twitter, and then Facebook, and other social networks like Tumblr. Um, and then adding more and more to that system. So today, we have a dashboard. Um, and what it does, it's called Nerve Center. And what it does is it ingests and measures a phenomenal amount of data, uh, every spoken word on TV and radio. So it's not just social anymore. We actually measure everything that's said on TV and radio in real time. We go speech to text, 40 hours of video per minute. Um, and then we analyze linguistically what's in the text. We also analyze everything that's being said on Twitter around any topic that our clients care about. Um, same with Facebook and these other networks. And we're adding in support now for other kinds of data, any kind of data, even enterprise data like sales data, IT data, the stock market. We measure 3 billion messages an hour right now. And that will grow tenfold over the next 18 months. Um, 
the way the system works is it visualizes what's going on in the data. So here we're looking at sonar on the topic big data. And this is showing you what are the trends around big data. Orange terms are um, gaining momentum. So what does this really look like? Why don't we just really look at it um, live. Let's animate this. So let's look at Nerve Center for a minute. So I'm looking at the tech, tech industry in Nerve Center. We're looking at all messages related to the tech industry. We're extracting all the nouns and noun phrases and other kinds of entities, about 30 different types of entity, people, links, hashtags, and many other things that we see. For every one of those, we measure um, metrics, volume, impressions, sentiment, and so on. So we get a sense of what is happening around this topic. So let's take something like um, Oster Pistorius on TV. So now this is coming from uh, 3,000 radio and TV stations. What's, what's being said about Oster Pistorius? So he was just mentioned here. We have the video. We have the transcript. Um, there's sound, but I think I speak you won't be able to hear it. But we have the video, we have the transcript, and we can see what is it connected to. So here's the trial, here, here are the topics that are trending, Riva Steenkamp, and so on. We can see the messages that are related and what people are saying. We can look at other things like, let's say, um, what's going on right now with emergency landings around the world? So this will show us a graph of emergency landings today. So here's one. Looks like passengers injured after Starbo airline makes emergency landing somewhere. We could go in and explore that. But more importantly, the system automates data science above, above this to figure out what were the significant events in all of this noise. So we're looking at literally millions to billions of messages. And we have to figure out what's actually important in all of this and what's, what's a hoax, what's noise. So we're doing predictive analytics, machine learning, uh, and many other things to try to figure out what's important in this data. We can also look at sentiment. So marketers at big companies um, this is not a customer, but it's an example. Here's Pfizer. What do people think about Pfizer? So let's look at Pfizer. This is 24 hours of Pfizer. Let's just take that out seven days. So very positive right now. Um, what are the top topics that are positive or negative about Pfizer? We can drill in and see for each one of these why is it positive or negative? What's happening? We might want to look at emotion. So here is a psychological profile of the conversation. What emotions do we see? Aggression, restraint, how is that changing? If you're looking at a public company, it's very interesting to see uh, if bearish emotions are gaining and bullish emotions are declining, right? Especially if you were a trader. Um, so there's lots of interesting uses for that. We can drill in and look at things like who are all the people talking about them, and we can drill into each one of these uh, different entities and see what they're saying. We can look at all the links in the airspace around the brand. And we can see spikes and trends when links move. So here's uh, a link that went viral. We can go in and see what it was, what people were saying, and exactly what the structure of that conversation was around that link. So this is real-time big data. We can also make inferences, like what are the occupations of people who talk about Pfizer? Journalists, senior managers, and so on. Where do they eat? Where do they dine? McDonald's and Starbucks. So we can see, we can make all kinds of inferences with the data. We're looking at data on 300 million people approximately against um, all of the data we see, in this case, about Pfizer. And then we can do really fancy things um, like make discoveries. So here, let's take Pfizer, let's take conversation about Pfizer, and let's correlate that with stock market activity for Pfizer. So what we're going to try to discover is what Clusters of conversation, particular demographics or hashtags, drive trading volume for Pfizer. So it will run through lots of different analytics here to try to answer that question. Um, we have a lot of different projects like this in R&D where we're now starting to try to automate what analysts do. So Bottlenose and, and this Nerve Center product are the beginning. We actually have a platform that will be rolling out uh, next year which lets anybody build their own applications to deal with massive real-time data. You've probably heard of Hadoop. Hadoop isn't really ideal for real-time analytics. We've done something new using Elasticsearch, uh, which does in under a second what would take an hour or many hours with Hadoop. So this is a system for doing real-time analytics. And we can search for anything and get you know, very fast answers. So let's say I said NFL here. What's the world thinking about the NFL? This is live. This isn't canned. It's not a saved query. You know, we pull in the data, we analyze it and figure out the trends, and continue uh, to update it 
as the trends continue. So we found that 80% of the time, we can find breaking news between tens to hundreds of minutes before all the major media outlets. And in general, we find trending keywords on ad networks and sites like Twitter um, hours to days before they become trends. And so customers can use this to buy ahead of the curve, to buy keywords before they become expensive. Or they can use us to figure out uh, what crises may affect their company or a stock they care about. Uh, or to look at sentiment about their brand during a crisis or during a launch. We work um, for in every major tentpole event, Super Bowl, Oscars, Grammys, all of these events for various brands, just helping them figure out if their ads are effective. So we've helped major advertisers change their ad strategies in real time during these events. For example, one advertiser, a uh, car manufacturer, had an ad that we saw that women hated during the Super Bowl. Women hated their ad. So during the Super Bowl, they made a new ad based on our data and, and released it during the Super Bowl and actually won back all these women who hated them. So it was a huge win. So there's these kinds of applications for the technology. So that's what Bottlenose does. Um, and by the way, we're hiring, and we're hiring a lot of people. So if you're interested in big data, analytics, data science, um, please get in touch, and I'll tell you how to do that. Can you just answer one question about Bottlenose? Yes, questions are great. Yeah, we could see any, any data that we, any data set, and we can find the trends. We're trying to automate trend detection, or what we call trend intelligence, in this massive data. So there's a lot of interesting applications, what's trending in real estate, or even you know, what's trending in the movie industry. <laughs> we can talk about that. So um, we also, with Bottlenose, would build these kind of big mission control centers, or small mission control centers, as the case may be, um, where clients could watch what was happening in real time um, during a situation across many dimensions. And that's been used a number of times. So that's really what I'm focused on right now. Uh, Bottlenose, uh, we started out, nobody would fund us. It was a science project. Um, I, I know a lot of VCs. I would say not every VC, but probably 80% of the VCs, certainly out here. Uh, I went to every single one of them, and the basic answer was, well, I don't care what you've done in the past. I don't care that you've had two IPOs. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Because this is a science project. There, at the time when we started it, there was no, prod, there was no product. There was just an engine. Um, so it was very hard to get funded. Eventually, um, I funded it myself. And then, uh, gradually, um, I, I met some angels who believed in what we were doing in New York. N nobody out here would, would fund us because, uh, first of all, we were based in LA, which was considered infinitely far away from San Francisco. Uh, secondly, um, you know, nobody really understood what big data was five years ago when we were doing this. So eventually, we, we, we ended up raising about $7 million in angel money, um, which was very hard, doing it in small increments until we, we got some, some bigger, bigger investors to get involved. And um, there, there's been some amazing progress on that front, which I can't announce yet. But uh, our funding problems have been solved um, for a long time into the future. Uh, so now we're going to be growing quite a bit. We're going to be growing rapidly from about just under 30 people towards 100 people. Um, so that's really uh, what's new in my life now and in my career. It's, it's growing Bottlenose to the next step. We, you know, we've got major brands using us, uh, automotive companies, pharmaceutical companies, we're, you know, government, uh, think tanks, um, movie studios. Warner Brothers uses us they, you know, to track what's going on in the studio with all of their films, games, and, and TV shows, for example. We've worked with a lot of big clients like Pepsi, for example. Uh, so that's been going really well. The product is monetizing. Its sales is repeatable. And it's, it's showing all the signs of being successful. So now it's all about growth. And um, that's really the next stage. So that's, that gets you kind of up to date with where I am now. And we'll open it up to questions. I just want to leave you with one thought. This was a woodcut. It's been colored in. But this is an, uh, a woodcut. Uh, believe, uh, people believe it's from Germany. It's called the Flammarion engraving, famous woodcut. What this shows is a guy, the bottom here, sticking his head out of the firmament of the stars. Um, at the time, people believed that the stars uh, rotated around the Earth. This person was sticking his head out of the sphere of the stars to see what was beyond. This was a woodcut that my father showed me as a child. And it's always been a metaphor. Uh, for what I've done in my career and kind of what I aspire to do. So with that, let's talk about questions and what you guys are thinking about. Thank you very, very much.
While I'm going over there, will you just talk about why bottlenose? Why, why the name? Why the name? Um, because bo uh, dolphins have sonar, and sonar was sort of one of our cool early features, that visualization I showed you. I thought it might have been because you wanted to study that. Yeah, and cute, yeah, well, dolphin research, and cute animals seem to do well. Yeah. Hello, uh, really interesting uh, to hear about all of your, I don't know, different ventures. One thing that came up, you mentioned you find breaking news tens to hundreds of minutes faster. Yeah. Um, if that, like, it, to the extent that's true, I imagine you can make millions off the stock market. So why, so if that's true, why even, like, license it? Why even give this technology to anyone? Why not just? Yeah, we get the hedge fund question a lot. Um, people ask, why don't you just start a hedge fund? And the bottom line is because it's just not what we know. It's not what we do. Um, somebody else can start a hedge fund using our data. But you know, one of the things I've learned is, is think about what you're good at and what you're really passionate about. Honestly, I don't really care that much about the stock market. Other people really care about it. Uh, I really care about you know, building the global brain and measuring it and mapping what the world is thinking. And finding applications for that is, are great. We've, we view those as kind of customer opportunities. Any uh, predictive analysis? Um, yeah, so we do predictive analytics on about 300 million data points an hour right now. We're predicting out about an hour right now. So when I say we detect these trends, sometimes even hours before they happen, we're seeing the early signs. We're not predicting the exact value of the trend, you know, exactly what the volume or impressions will be, but we are saying this is going to be big, or it's not, or it's going up or down. So we can see that already. Now one of the frontiers we're working on is to try to predict further out. Um, we're using machine learning to do this. Um, so that's kind of a big push. Uh, another area that we're working on is automating what analysts and data scientists do to do it faster against more data. So things like trend detection, which is really advanced statistics and physics, basically, to try to filter a lot of uh, noise to find little bits of signal. Um, turns out to be really hard, and we're, we're doing it at incredibly high speed on huge amounts of data. Hi. Raise your hand, I can't. Um, oh, hi. Yeah, it's a bit controversial, hypothetical. Um, if in the situation you had access to everyone's private conversations as well, yeah. would you see a business model with that kind of data, yeah. with bottlenose, and is that, can you handle that volume and the capacity in we, that software? Well, yes, in theory we could scale to handle it. Um, there are ethical questions, as you mentioned. Um, we don't look at private data today, we only look at public data. Um, We've thought long and hard about that. Number one, we don't have access to private data. Uh, if a customer had private data that they had the rights to uh, from their customers, we can certainly analyze that. Uh, but we won't do it unless somebody has the rights to the data. But in theory, yes, we can do it and get a lot of insights. So for example, look at all the customer emails or customer support issues flowing into a call center from sp in speech right, and text. Analyze that and figure out what are the issues that your customers are having, and how does that maybe correlate with sales? So we can, we can, we can do that, and we're working on things like that, actually. Uh, who's next? OK, in the front here, or yes? Only, uh, it's just hard to hear. It. We, we, you're being filmed. We want to get all these questions on, see if we can kind of spike your name on your own on bottle. Right, list. right. Everybody tweet, at Nova Spivak with a CK, and see if we can make me register in my own tool. Um. So as what I understand, um, Bottlenose is not open to the public right no, now, right? No, it was. Any, yeah. It was when we started. And then we learned um, that the real business opportunity was in the enterprise. And so um, we went more and more high end. And it's more expensive to do that. And so now we don't give it away. We sell it. So any prediction that in the future search engines much more powerful than search engines would be open to the public and replace the search engines? Yeah, I mean, I would love to build a consumer search engine based on our technology. Uh, I thought about it for a long time. It's definitely very close to my heart. Would love to do it. Uh, and it might happen, but uh, not, not right away. Hi, so it's a, I have two questions for you. The first is, um, I'm studying applied math here at Berkeley, and I'm graduating kind of You're feeling... Hired. What? You're hired. Yeah, well, I, I hope, I, I wish, is what I guess the, the thesis is, I, I'm graduating feeling underprepared for any, 
for any real career, mm. especially in data science, which I'm incredibly interested in. But uh, the education here in math is a little, uh, I think, abstract mm. and and uh, theoretical. So um, well, don't worry about that. When I studied computer science, I, it was all in Lisp. Okay. Okay. So. And then, so my second question, you, you said something interesting about um, the, global, the global brain. Yeah. And uh, I was thinking about uh, what that implies for, if you sell, to these, if you sell this, this data these, to these marketing companies, to these, to these ad agencies, do you think that um, it'll kind of cycle back to create a more homogenous global brain in that people, the, the ad agencies will know what people want to hear and how to say it, and then and then what we see is just like less diversity in what people are talking about and saying uh, and thinking about. Well, I would actually spin it differently, and I would say you know you'd get less spam and more relevant stuff from them, which might be good. Um, I think that it can make the world more responsive. It speeds up the cybernetic feedback loop um, between consumers and providers. Uh, they can see each other better. In, you know, first enable the companies to see what their, what their markets and what their customers want, but also what other companies are doing. Let policymakers also learn from this data. So I think, I think speeding up the feedback loop, um, which used to take months to years to get this kind of data, um, can't, you know, it's, you can't say it's good or bad. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental technology, which I'm sure some people will use for good or for bad, but it moves, it moves everybody forward. It, it, raises, it raises the bar, and we you know, used to say, a rising tide lifts all boats. Right? But, but as far as applied math and being prepared for a data science career, there's a tremendous shortage of data scientists right now. There's a lot of talk about big data. Actually, I, I mean, I work with a lot of big brands, and they don't have data scientists. I mean, they have like two or three. You'd be surprised. Some of these giant companies, we're talking global company, companies in 80 countries, have five data scientists. It's, there's an incredible lack of data scientists and a tremendous growing sudden demand for data scientists. It's probably the best thing you could put on your resume right now. Um, analysts are another area, which are sort of like lightweight data scientists. They don't have as much math or database skills, but they can make sense of data. Um, that's also in short supply. Thank you so much for your wonderful insights today. Um, two kind of parallel questions. What is the competition for bottlenose right now? That, and that being said, not only for bottlenose, but for your career, what has been your fear along the way? I mean, your bubble has burst twice. Yep. Uh, you came out of uh, college and then started a lot of the big things that you did rather than while you were in college. And quite often that can be a daunting experience because now you suddenly don't have family support and things and you're <laughs> kind of on your own. So two parallel questions. Yeah, what yeah. is competition and what is fear? All right. So on the competition side, um, our model has evolved over time. When we began, we were selling mostly to marketers. We are increasingly, as, as, as we roll out our platform, we'll be able to look at any data, any kind of data. And so it won't only be marketers who are using us to analyze trends. It could be the CFO looking at trends in their sales data. It could be the head of support in a company trying to understand what's going on with customers. And so there's been a big shift in, as we've evolved. We've, we've basically um, realized that trend intelligence, real-time trend intelligence, is something that's going to be necessary across every function in the enterprise. Um, so who we compete with has started to change. It, when, it, when, we, when we began, we competed with companies like Radiant, you know, Radiant 6, which is now Salesforce Marketing Cloud, um, and many other social dashboards that were really exclusively providing intelligence to advertisers and marketers. Today, we wouldn't say they are our competitors. Today, um, in, in our thinking, our competitors are companies um, that have big data analytics clouds, and there's many of them. Um, because we'll be releasing something that takes what I've shown you as a product and just removes the user interface and says, here, build your own. Here are all the tools, here are all the widgets, here's the underlying engine, build your own. You can use ours if you want. If you want a really good dashboard, we made one. But everything that we figured out that to enable this to work at this kind of scale, uh, we're going to actually sell as a platform. So all of a sudden, we'll be in a different world competing with companies that that do big data analytics uh, against you know, massive enterprise data sets. So it's changing. Um, as far as the winding and completely unexpected path that I took, you know, I had completely wrong ideas about what I was going to do when I was in college. I thought I was going to be a tech journalist, and I thought I was going to be a painter. 
you know, then I decided I was going to be a cognitive scientist, and then I was going to be an artificial intelligence programmer, and you know, I went through all kinds of different interests. I thought I might be in the film industry. I think if there's one theme in my story, it's that I tried a lot of stuff. It wasn't random. It was my interests. It was my passions. But I tried them. I took the opportunity while I was in college um, to try a lot of things and follow a lot of interests. And I'm just that kind of person. I'm very multidisciplinary. And that's, I actually pride myself on that. Um, so that, you know, I would say this. You know, whatever you think you're going to do right now is probably not what you're going to do. But what you will do is going to be strangely related to what you're doing now. It's weird. Life makes sense in hindsight. It does. Everything that I did, everything I showed you, all connects. And actually, in bottlenose, almost everything I've done, except for dolphin, well, no, even dolphin research, comes together. Right? Everything comes together in this project. So in, it, in each project you do, you're going to see a lot of the different things you've done come together. And it, you may change careers three or four times in your life. It's, there are studies that show now that, that people today change careers three, three times, I think, in their life. So don't worry, actually. What I think you should do is focus on having fun. Focus on what is it that really excites you, that like, you know, if you could get paid to do it and it was legal, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's really that. That's how you should think. Follow, you know, they used to say, follow your bliss, right? Really, though, it's, it's true. What is it? Is it? Is it solving problems? Is it making the world a better place? Is it making discoveries? Is it being on stage? Is it uh, making money? What is it that really excites you? That's, I think, how you, how, how you should make these choices about what you do. And then just get out there. Try to find the companies that are doing the coolest, most interesting, boldest things that you know, would be cr someday when you're doing what I'm doing, you can tell people that you did that, and people will be like, what? You know, that's crazy. But it's kind of cool, too, right? Find those opportunities and do those when you're in your 20s and even into your 30s. Because those will eventually lead you to the thing that you really end up doing as your career. I'm totally against the idea of deciding your career when you're 18 and then just going on some straight line all the way through for the rest of your life. I think, first of all, it's boring. Second of all, it's unlikely that at 18 you're going to make good decisions about you know, the rest of your life. So don't even try. As for family support, you know, it's cultural. It really varies. So in some cultures, you know, it's very, uh, I would say, taboo to, to go out and wildly experiment and not know what you're going to do and, and not have a steady income and not have a career path. That can be a big problem in some cultures. I have a lot of friends you know, from certain countries that they got a lot of family pressure about that. Just ignore it. Do it. It's your life. This is, all, this is the life you get. You just got to do it. They'll, they'll be glad you did when you come back and you're famous and successful you know, and, you, and, you, and you cured cancer or whatever it is. They'll be glad you did it. OK. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, I have a question. So you were talking about an ad campaign which was run and how certain sections of the population did not like it and how you measured that yeah. and how then you changed it for the Super Bowl ad campaign and they liked it. How, did, how exactly did you measure whether they liked it or not? Yeah. And so I, I showed you very quick. Oh, go ahead. Finish. Yeah. And, uh, what percentage or what conversion did you achieve from okay. the people who hated yeah. it too? Um, well, in this particular case, it was a major auto manufacturer. I can't name who it was. Um, but um, we saw sentiment uh, among women trending down almost immediately after the ad launched. Um, and we saw it spreading and going viral. Women all over the, all over the US were picking this up, the act activists. Um, about how misogynistic this particular company's ad was. Um, and so you know, we saw that immediately. And we were running one of these mission controls during the Super Bowl for that client. So they could see it. You know, and it was, they just saw this kind of downward red line. It was bad. Right? So in that particular project, they actually had a sound stage right next to the mission control that we were running. And they shot a new ad. They, that, they were ready to do that. It was a, an experiment in real-time marketing. So we had our analysts sitting in front of our, our nerve center. And then right next to it was a complete production studio. And they, they took the data, they shot new ads, and they put them up on YouTube. And they did a series of ads and entered into a dialogue with the audience. So people would comment on each video they made. They'd shoot a new one to respond to that. And gradually, they evolved the campaign in a direction that then shifted sentiment back up. And at the end, people were like, this company's amazing. Yay, you know, women love them, 
right? So this all happened in the space of a few hours. And it was an amazing real-time marketing case. Um, real-time marketing is a new thing. You may remember Oreo Dunk in the Dark. Did you guys hear about this when the lights went out? Um, or at a big sporting event, Oreo made an ad in real time that you could dunk in the dark. And they put, that ad came out while the blackout was happening during the game. That started this whole big obsession with real-time marketing. Um, so this was a more sophisticated example of that type of real-time marketing. Um, how do we know if that helped? Well, we could see that sentiment went up. Um, but uh, in addition, they, we could see that they got tremendous numbers of views on these videos that they shot based on our guidance. So, so how do you measure linguistically, we, um, we measure sentiment by doing linguistics on what people say. Um, so we actually understand sentence structure and the meaning of the words, and we, we actually can rate um, how positive or negative each expression is. So each tweet, each mention on Facebook, and so forth. And then we can graph sentiment that way. not on Bollinos per se, but in the media. Yeah, um, you'll probably be hearing some things about us. Uh, we'll have some announcements later, not, not right away, but soon, um, about some progress we've made. And uh, as I mentioned, I, I mean, you guys are still in school, but uh, we are looking for smart uh, mathematicians, programmers, or people who want to be on more of the business side of those kinds of disciplines. Um, we're based in LA, but uh, we'll have offices in many locations. Uh, New York, LA, uh, and Amsterdam already. So it's pretty cool. So let us know if you're interested. Just email me. Uh, Nova, thank you. And thank I know you. there will be questions afterwards. And if you all want to continue to talk about machine learning, which is fascinating, 11th floor CET. Changming is going to be there talking this evening as of 8? 8 p.m. Just in case you haven't gotten enough, I'm looking forward to hearing more myself. So thank you, everybody, and thank you, Nova. Thank you.